I'd like to recognize before we begin that we are in Indian country. We are sitting in Indian country. In this particular instance, it is Lummi and Nutsak country, but when we go forth from here, when we commute back to our homes or we return to visit friends and relatives anywhere in the state of Washington, in fact, anywhere in the United States or Canada, anywhere between the Arctic Ocean and the tip of Patagonia, we will be in someone's indigenous ancestral territory, lands that have been occupied for tens of thousands of years, and as some believe, since time immemorial. Many of us, myself included, are newcomers here. It is respectful, it is decent, it is the right thing to do to acknowledge where we are and on whose land we are living. I'd also like to thank all of the folks who worked to bring me here and to make this such a delightful and rewarding visit. I know that you spent hours on the telephone, organizing, planning, putting this together, and I thank you. I am grateful for the work that you did. Thank you very much. There's one more thing I'd like to say before we begin, and that is that for some people in this room, these soul wounds that we are going to discuss are still bleeding. They are not healed. They are painful. People who are experiencing this and who need a break to say a prayer, to meditate for a moment, to get fresh air, I welcome you to take a break. I will not be offended. And I would ask everybody else, if someone needs to quickly exit, that we make room for them and that we respect the experience that they are having. The ceremony continued until just before dawn. Illuminated by a central fire, celebrants moved in ancient rhythms. The women's clamshell necklaces, as you see here in this photo, clicking gently against their seashell dresses. Male dancers in the regalia of birds, deer, and hunters stood between the women holding them up as they moved in their heavy regalia. Meanwhile, singers raised their voices to the sky in the ancient formulas of Nidash, the feather, the feather dance, giving thanks not only for the creation of the world, but for its continuous renewal in each and every moment. Finally, the celebrants stopped, and they moved away from the fire arm in arm to go into snug redwood houses with peaked roofs. Outside, Lake Earl lapped gently at the shore. Inside, Talawa people bedded down next to kith, kin, and visiting Indian relatives from other nations. The celebrants were unaware that less than eight miles away, white men in Crescent City had established their own branch of California's ever-expanding killing machine, and were preparing to put their units into action. Crescent City's Coast Rangers and Klamath Mounted Rangers had been well armed by the governor of California. California Governor John Bigler had provided them with 20 muskets, 95 rifles, swords, sabers, and thousands of rounds of ammunition. These militiamen from these two state-recognized units now prepared to do one thing and one thing only, kill California Indian civilians. In the pre-dawn hours of the final day of 1854, as many as 116 militiamen accompanied by an unknown number of colonial auxiliaries quietly surrounded the village on the shores of the lake and took up positions hidden behind rocks or concealed by brush. At daybreak, as women, men, children, and elders emerged from the redwood houses to begin the day, the militiamen and their auxiliary supporters opened fire. They shot them down, said one militiaman eyewitness, just as fast as they could reload their weapons. <laughs> 
Possessing only three guns, the Talawa and their visitors were unable to adequately defend themselves. A few plunged into the waters of Lake Earl, but as they swam toward the opposite shore, they were shot down by snipers positioned there the night before. When the shooting and the screaming stopped, perhaps hundreds of Indian people were dead. Not more than five from the entire village seemed to have survived. The attackers, meanwhile, suffered a single casualty and were later paid by the state of California for this work. A very uncomfortable reality about United States history, which is that many of us grew up on farms and ranches and in towns and cities that are indigenous land that was stolen, that was stolen through mass systematic violence. These are uncomfortable truths to reconcile ourselves to. They're very challenging and they undermine the narrative that we see in the cinema and the narrative that we see in the propagandistic 19th and 20th century art that's in our museums. So it's, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's a long, slow process to challenge that Turnerian narrative. And at the same time, one of the challenges is simply to get people to understand that there are over five million American Indian people living in the United States. That there are almost 600 federally recognized nations in the United States who have sovereignty. And that that sovereignty is supported by the Constitution of the United States. Why is it so hard to get people to understand and accept that? Because those laws, the highest laws of our land, have been so consistently and methodically broken and violated again and again and again. Between the years 1846 and 1873, California's indigenous population plunged from perhaps 150,000 people to not more than 30 or 35,000 people. Now diseases Dislocation, starvation, and exposure caused many of these thousands of deaths. However, abduction, unfree labor, mass death on federal Indian reservations, homicides, battles, and over 300 separate massacres took thousands of lives and hindered biological reproduction. This was, as I argue in the book, a case of genocide. But what do I mean by genocide? I'm using a particular definition. The 1948 United Nations Convention on Genocide. <clears throat> and there are two things that a prosecutor has to prove in order to convince a judge and jury in an international court that a defendant was in fact guilty of genocide. The first thing which you see up here on this slide is intent. It's a special kind of intent. In fact, international lawyers and international legal scholars call it special intent because it is different from intent associated with crimes in any other kind of case. It is the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. That's the intent portion. The second thing that the prosecutor has to prove is that the defendant has committed beyond any reasonable shadow of a doubt one of the five genocidal crimes enumerated here by the convention. So the convention provides scholars with a clear internationally recognized rubric for evaluating instances of genocide, including historical cases not subject to legal jurisdiction. To reiterate, First, perpetrators must evince intent to destroy a group as such, and second, they must commit one of the five genocidal acts against one of the four protected groups. Following the formulation of this new international legal treaty, scholars began to carefully re-examine California's conquest and colonization. And by the year 2000, more than 20 of these scholars had deemed what happened in California between 1846 and 1873 to be a case of genocide. So why write a 700-page book on this topic? Because so little 
has been written about the genocide that took place in California, at least compared to some of the more canonical genocides, such as Rwanda, Cambodia, and the Holocaust. Building on previous scholarship, this book then is the first comprehensive year-by-year, month-by-month, week-by-week recounting of the genocide that took place in California. So why be so detailed? Why create a book with nearly 200 pages of appendices listing all of the killings that could be found during this period? This topic, I believe, calls for meticulous analysis because, as in all cases of genocide, the stakes are so high. In this particular case, the stakes are particularly high for scholars, California Indian people, and all human beings living in what are now the United States. If United States citizens founded some regions of California, if not the state as a whole, upon deliberate attempts to physically annihilate California Indian people, scholars will need to reevaluate some of the basic interpretive axioms that we use to understand California history. Scholars could, for example, re-examine the widespread assumption that indirect effects of colonization, like epidemic disease, rather than direct effects of colonization, like intentional mass murder, were the leading cause of California Indian population decline. Exceptionalist interpretations of US history, which posit that the history of the United States is fundamentally different from the history of any other country on the face of the earth, also lose validity as researchers begin to compare the genocide that took place in California to colonial genocides that took place elsewhere in human history. A careful study of genocide in California will also assist researchers and scholars who seek to understand the larger hemispheric indigenous population decline that radically depopulated the entire hemisphere. Where scholars document a particular case of genocide, it becomes necessary then to evaluate what roles governments and private individuals played in the process, as well as whether or not the violence was part of a recurring regional, national, continental, or even hemispheric process. Larger questions then follow. What tended to catalyze genocide? Who ordered the killing? Who carried out the killing? Why do we not know more about these events? Did democracy drive mass murder? And ultimately, what role did genocide play in the making of modern Canada, the United States, Mexico, and the other nations of the Americas? The genocide question is particularly urgent for California's approximately 150,000 California Indian people. This map gives you some sense of the linguistic and cultural diversity that is present in California. Should California Indian people press for government apologies, reparations, and control of land where genocidal events took place? Will tribes marshal evidence of genocide in cases involving tribal sovereignty and federal recognition? How should California Indian people commemorate the victims of mass murder while also emphasizing successful accommodation, resistance, survival, and ongoing cultural renewal? The psychological re issues related to genocide, as I have found in my many visits to California Indian communities, are also particularly fraught. What happens when a tribal member learns that she or he is the descendant of both genocide perpetrators and genocide survivors? How might California Indian communities reconcile increased knowledge of genocide, sometimes at the hands of federal agencies and federal employees, with their often intense patriotism? Finally, what role might acknowledgement of genocide have on the intergenerational historical trauma prevalent 
in so many California Indian communities. And that intergenerational historical traumas direct linkages to present day physical illnesses, substance abuse, domestic violence, and some of the highest rates of suicide of any group being tracked in California today. The question of genocide in California also poses explosive questions for everyone living in the United States. Should government officials tender public apologies as Presidents Ronald Reagan and George Herbert Walker Bush did in the 1980s for the forcible relocation and internment of some 120,000 Japanese Americans, many of them California citizens, during the Second World War? Should federal officials offer monetary compensation along the lines of the more than $1.6 billion that Congress has now paid out to these Japanese Americans and their heirs? Might California officials decrease their cut of California Indians $7.3 billion a year in gaming revenues as one way of paying reparations? A better understanding of the genocide that took place in California might also impact the federal government's dealings with the scores of California Indian communities that are today seeking federal acknowledgement and the full status as federally recognized tribes in California. The question of commemoration is closely linked. Will non-Indian people support or even tolerate the commemoration of mass murders carried out by some of California's founding fathers with the same kinds of monuments, museums, state legislated days of remembrance that today commemorate the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust? Will genocides against California Indian peoples join these systematic mass murders in public school curricula or in our public discourse? These questions are important, but they cannot really be addressed without a comprehensive understanding of the fraught relations between natives and newcomers that took place in California between 1846 and 1873. Sporadic mass killing of California Indian people punctuated the initial years of US rule in California. But it was James Marshall's 1848 gold strike near Sacramento that precipitated a local genocide. Oregon men moving south to take advantage of California's glittering possibilities played a leading role in increasing violence against California Indians. They rarely had connections to California's Hispanic society in which indigenous people played important roles in fields, on farms, in bedrooms, and in houses. And many of these newcomers from Oregon conceived of California's indigenous people as little more than dangerous obstacles to the rapid acquisition of wealth. In 1849, the second year of the gold rush, Oregonian attacks on California Indians increased in both frequency and lethality, particularly in the central mines where the gold rush was now booming. You can see the central mines are that middle map area uh, in between the northern mines and the southern mines. 149er explained in his journal, and I quote, Oregon people had been used to shooting Indians, and they did shoot them freely, end quote. That April, one miner entered the epicenter of this local genocide, Coloma at Sutter's Mill, where Marshall had first found the gold. In the central mines, this miner and other eyewitnesses recounted multiple massacres, scalpings of California Indian people, and the slaying of surrendered California Indian civilians. Due to spotty primary source coverage, this was a time when there were no newspapers yet in these areas. We will never know the exact number of California Indians murdered by whites in and around the mines in 1849 and early 1850. But hundreds, if not thousands, certainly suffered violent deaths. What was absolutely clear to observers was the exterminatory nature of these killings, both in their intent and in their impact. 
The slaying of two white men, notorious serial rapists and Indian slaveholders, near Clear Lake in December of 1849, precipitated the massive spread of violence. In response to this double homicide, vigilantes and United States Army soldiers killed as many as 1,000 California Indians or more between the final days of 1849 and May 15, 1850. Vigilantes first murdered and massacred large numbers of Indian farm workers in the Napa and Sonoma Valleys, the areas now celebrated as some of the finest wine-growing regions in the world. Then after authorities arrested some of these vigilantes, California's Supreme Court, in its very first case, let all eight men go on bail and never sought to formally prosecute them. Meanwhile, the United States Army also sought to avenge the deaths of the two white ranchers. In an article titled, Horrible Slaughter of Indians, one San Francisco newspaper described a massacre committed by the United States Army on Clear Lake using information provided directly to them by a United States Army captain. And I quote, little or no resistance was encountered and the work of butchery was of short duration. Neither sex nor age was spared. It was the order of extermination fearfully obeyed. As many as 800 California Indian people, Pomos and Wapos, died that day. Other killings followed, and the officers involved were not censured. In fact, they were all promoted. Two of them became U.S. Army generals. One of them became the governor of the state of California. A new factor was at work, large-scale extended vigilante and United States Army killing campaigns tolerated by both state and federal authorities. As the gold rush continued, newcomers surged into the state. Before the gold rush began, there were not more than 14,000 non-Indian people living in the entire state of California. But by the year 1860, census takers counted over 360,000 newcomers in the state. This was, in fact, the largest mass migration in the United States 19th century history. These newcomers came primarily in search of wealth, but in seeking to access gold, eat, dress, acquire labor, and satisfy sexual desires, immigrants placed immense pressures on California Indians. These demands triggered an explosion in ranching, hunting, gold mining, and slave raiding. These activities then generated shockwaves that had devastating impacts on California Indians throughout the state. But California's new leaders magnified that impact. Under martial law, the US military officers in charge of governing California made California Indian people into second-class subjects with few rights. California's 1849 Constitution then made it all but impossible for California Indian people to vote. And in 1850, when California's legislature met for the very first time, their focus at the very beginning was to deny California Indian people legal rights. So they first barred all Indian people from voting. Then they barred Indians with one half of Indian blood or more from giving evidence for or against whites in criminal cases. And they also banned Indian people from serving as jurors. They later barred Indian people from working as attorneys in the state. In combination, these laws largely shut Indians out of participation in and protection by the state's legal system. And abduction played a major role in the California Indian catastrophe. In 1850, legislators passed what they deemed an act for the government and protection of Indians. Very rarely has a law been so misnamed. This law legalized white custody of Indian minors and Indian prisoner leasing while allowing courts and juries to summarily reject the testimony of Indians. In 
Indian people could thus be forced into unpaid work on trumped up charges. This is a rather remarkable document that I came across in the Bancroft Library, the archival holdings of the University of California at Berkeley. This is an ad for a slave. This is an ad, it's in French, I've provided a rough translation, advertising a 16-year-old Southern California Indian female at the price of a pound of gunpowder and a bottle of brandy. It's quite strong evidence for how the Indian slave trade spread throughout California. In 1860, legislators extended that first 1850 act to legalize the indenture of any Indian. In combination, the law of 1850 and the law of 1860 triggered a boom in Indian slave raiding while separating men and women during peak reproductive years, both of which accelerated California Indian population decline. If we were a California Indian village and kidnappers slash slave raiders descended upon us in the room, all of us who are adult men would probably have been summarily killed. Very few of us would have been allowed to live. Women would have been taken away and sold into captivity using the laws of indenture and the laws of custodianship as a legal camouflage to facilitate what was often extended lifelong terms of servitude. Making the system even worse, many treated California Indian unfree laborers as entirely disposable. One lawyer recalled, and I quote, Los Angeles had its slave mart, and thousands of honest, useful people were absolutely destroyed in this way. Indeed, between the years 1850 and 1860, Los Angeles's Indian population plunged from 3,693 people to just 219. Of course, California Indian people resisted. And escape was one way that California Indians defied servitude. But whites sometimes responded with overwhelming lethal force. The Lassic Wailaki woman, Lucy Young, pictured here, escaped servitude multiple times. She recollected, and I quote, young woman being stole by white people, come back shot through lights and liver, front skin hang down like apron, she tie up with cotton dress, never die neither. Others were less fortunate. After one California Indian woman fled her, quote, lord and master with his Indian boy, whites massacred an entire village of some 15 California Indian people. Two years later, a rancher became so incensed when his seven-year-old Indian servant visited his family half a mile away, that he, quote, slaughtered the whole family of six persons, boy and all, end quote. And lest you think that such reporting was hidden and secretive, that last quotation came from a San Francisco newspaper. This kind of evidence was widely available to the public. Now, despite such reports, policymakers failed to intervene while almost all law enforcement officials consistently turned a blind eye to such practices. The United States Congress, meanwhile, made California Indian people particularly vulnerable to immigration's blast. In the years 1851 and 1852, federal treaty agents, these are the men that you see pictured here in this photograph, <coughs> signed 18 separate treaties with 119 California Indian communities, allocating them 7,488,000 acres. Those are the areas that you see in gray there um, in the western portions of the state. Those are the reservations that were to be set up. However, United States senators meeting in a secret session unanimously repudiated every one of these treaties. Instead, in 1853, Congress authorized five temporary military reservations not to exceed 25,000 acres each and conferred no land titles or legal recognition on California Indian people. The results were fourfold. 
set the stage for the disaster. First, reservations were not patented, so jurisdiction over them was left uncertain. Second, because jurisdiction remained uncertain, confusion and conflict between and among state and federal authorities prevailed. It was never exactly clear who had ultimate authority to enact laws and enforce laws on these temporary military reservations. Third, California Indian people did not become the explicit federal wards of the United States government. Finally, Major General John Wool's 1857 interpretation of California reservations' legal status denied them army protection. And I quote, until these reservations are perfected, the United States troops have no right to exclude whites from entering and occupying the reserves or even to prevent their taking Indians, squaws, and children, end quote. Federal officials thus made California Indian people particularly vulnerable to kidnapping, slavery, assault, and murder. The establishment of California's killing machine now gave rise to, to much wider, uh, more lethal violence. Between the years 1850 and 1864, 3,414 California men enrolled voluntarily in 24 volunteer militia expeditions. These expeditions killed, by conservative count, at least 1,342 California Indian people. However, their impact transcended these numbers. Militiamen served as a widely publicized endorsement of Indian killing, communicating an unofficial grant of legal impunity for Indian killing and inspiring many more vigilante killings. In fact, vigilantes killed at least 6,400 California Indian people between the years 1846 and 1873. In January of 1851, California's governor, Peter Burnett, declared, and I quote, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged until the Indian race becomes extinct. Now, lest you think that this man was a rogue operator, the very next month, state legislators voted to borrow $500,000, a huge amount of money at this time, for past and future anti-Indian militia campaigns. Meanwhile, the United States Army donated arms to supply and weaponize these militiamen, and the state with these weapons was able to build up a substantial armory based in San Francisco. But the state of California quickly ran through that first $500,000 that they had raised. And so in May of 1852, the state passed a $600,000 bond measure to support additional militia operations, even as vigilante killings continued. So we're actually looking at one of these bonds here. You notice there is George Washington in the right-hand side of the bond, and at the top of the bond, uh, we see probably a Haudenosaunee or Iroquois uh, warrior pictured there. At the bottom of the bond, what you don't see, you can see the ragged edge there. The bond coupons have been detached. These bonds paid a quite generous interest payment of 7%. They were guaranteed by the state of California. And so they were quite a good investment at the time. They also came in a variety of denominations. This is a relatively large one at $250, probably meant for an institutional investor, perhaps Wells Fargo Bank. But there were also smaller denomination bonds, which meant that individuals could purchase these bonds. So a wide variety of people in California society <laughs> became parties to supporting the intentional destruction of California Indian people by virtue of buying the bonds that paid for the killing. The Sinkion Indian woman Sally Bell, pictured here, provided a rare California Indian eyewitness account of a massacre that took place in her homeland on California's northwest coast sometime in the mid-1850s. Bell remembered, and I quote, 
About 10 o'clock in the morning, some white men came. They killed my grandfather and my mother and my father. I saw them do it. Then they killed my baby sister and cut her heart out and threw it into the brush where I ran and hid. My little sister was a baby, just crawling around. I didn't know what to do. I was so scared, I guess I just hid there for a long time with my little sister's heart in my hands. It was a terrifying time to be a California Indian person. The United States Congress now endorsed such killing. In 1854, Congress allocated $924,000 to reimburse the state of California for its past volunteer militia campaigns against California Indian people. Meanwhile, state leaders and federal leaders worked to perfect the killing machine. This man, State Quartermaster and Adjutant General Kibbe, who was in charge of the state's militia operations from the 19, 1850s through 1861, wrote a tactical manual, had it published, and distributed it, paid for by the state, to every militia officer in California. That same year, then Secretary of War Jefferson Davis sent a box of tactical manuals that were meant for the US Army, but he had them distributed to all of Kibbe's officers. In 1857, having now run through the $1.1 million that they had already raised, state legislators in Sacramento appropriated an additional $410,000 for additional militia campaigns with predictable results. Finally, in 1861, Congress appropriated another $400,000 to pay additional California militia operations. Civilians and officials also carried out large-scale forced removal operations meant to concentrate California Indian populations on those temporary military reservations that we discussed earlier. And these removals were often lethal. In 1856, vigilantes massacred 55 Indian people while forcibly removing one group to the Mendocino Reservation. The Lake Yakuts woman Yoimut recollected that during the forced removal of her community to the Fresno Reservation in California's Central Valley, soldiers killed 12 Indians and another 12 died on the trip. Likewise, the Nomlaki man Andrew Freeman recollected, and I quote, when they took the Indians to the Round Valley Reservation, they drove them like stock. They shot the old people who couldn't make the trip. They would shoot children who were getting tired along the way. Once at reservations, California Indian people often encountered institutionalized malnutrition and lethal starvation. The Konkau leader Tamayanem recollected that after volunteers had forcibly removed his people to the Mendocino Reservation, we were very hungry and the Konkaus began to die very fast. Other reservations proved little better. In about 1860, Tomayanem led his people south to the Round Valley Reservation where he recollected there was even less to eat. Indeed, in 1860, officials typically provided 480 to 910 calories per day to working Round Valley Indians. Two years later, daily rations there had fallen to just 160 to 390 calories per working person per day. Further diminishing these inadequate rations, those who did not work were not fed. So those who were working had to share what meager rations they had with their sick friends, relatives, and community members. So if some California Indian reservation inmates died of institutionalized starvation, Malnutrition profoundly weakened the immune systems of many others, making them more susceptible to lethal diseases. Importantly, malnutrition and starvation also predictably decreased human fecundity while increasing 
the number of miscarriages and stillbirths. Some reservation officials and colonists also utilized California Indian people as disposable laborers. According to one colonist providing testimony to a court, and I quote, about 300 Indian people died on the Round Valley Indian Reservation during the winter of 1856 to 1857 from the effects of packing them through the mountains in the snow and mud. They were generally worked naked and packed 50 pounds if able, end quote. At California's Indian reservations, institutionalized neglect took an untold number of lives. Federal employees also killed California Indian people more directly. During the United States Civil War, 15,725 men volunteered to join the Union Army in California. Thousands of these volunteers remained in California and soon radically transformed the state's Indian killing machine. As official United States troops, these so-called California volunteers replaced relatively small, short-term volunteer state militia campaigns with much larger and much longer United States Army killing campaigns. In fact, the Army now fielded the largest military operations ever seen in the region. Vigilante operations flourished alongside these campaigns, but the genocide now became primarily a United States government project. And US Army forces killed substantial numbers. The very first California Volunteers campaign near the Oregon border in 1862 killed at least 120 California Indian people. Hundreds more would die in succeeding campaigns led by West Point trained officers like this man, Henry M. Black. California Volunteers also killed prisoners en masse on multiple occasions. Cavalry Captain Moses McLaughlin proudly reported how in 1863, and I quote, I had all the bucks collected together and 35 were either shot or sabered. Not one escaped, end quote. McLaughlin concluded, they will soon either be killed off or pushed so far into the surrounding deserts that they shall perish by absolute famine. The U.S. Army continued killing California Indian people through the late 1860s. Even after officers concluded their last large-scale anti-Indian operation in the 1872-1873 Modoc War, they hanged and beheaded four surrendered Modoc prisoners before shipping their severed heads to Washington, D.C. The California Indian catastrophe of 1846 to 1873 clearly fits the two-part legal definition set forth by the UN Genocide Convention. First, perpetrators demonstrated in both word and in deed intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. Second, they committed all five of the genocidal acts enumerated in the convention. Killing members of the group occurred in more than 370 separate massacres during this period, as well as hundreds of smaller killings, homicides, and executions. Sources indicate that between 1846 and 1873, vigilantes, militiamen, and soldiers killed at least 9,492 to 16,094 California Indians, and probably many more. My quantitative estimates are based on very conservative numbers. By way of contrast, California Indian people killed fewer than 1,500 non-Indian people during this entire period. But other acts of genocide proliferated too. Many rapes and beatings occurred, and these meet the convention's definition of causing serious bodily harm to victims on the basis of their group identity and with the intent to destroy that group. 
the sustained military and civilian policy of demolishing California Indian villages and their food stores while driving Indian survivors into inhospitable desert and mountain regions amounted to deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Some Office of Indian Affairs employees administering federal Indian reservations in California committed the same genocidal crime. Further, because malnutrition and exposure predictably lowered fertility while increasing the number of miscarriages and stillbirths, some state and federal officials may also be guilty of imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Finally, the state slave raiders and federal officials were all involved in forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. 3,000 to 4,000 or more California Indian children suffered such forced transfers between 1850 and 1863 alone. By breaking up families and whole indigenous communities, forced removals also constituted imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Sufficient evidence then exists to designate the California Indian catastrophe a case of genocide, at least according to the United Nations Convention. Elected California state officials were the primary architects of annihilation. Legislators created a legal environment in which California Indian people, as I've said before, had almost no rights thus granting those who attacked them virtual legal impunity. Moreover, two different governors threatened physical annihilation, and both governors and elected officials cooperated in building a state-sponsored killing machine. California governors called out or authorized no fewer than 24 militia expeditions. State legislators raised up to $1.5 million to fund them. By demonstrating that the state would not punish Indian killers, but instead financially reward them, state militia expeditions inspired a far larger number of vigilante killings. Finally, in 1863, after the United States government supplanted the state of California as the primary state-sponsored killing force, California legislators passed a bill allocating an additional $600,000 to encourage more California men to enlist in the Union Army during the Civil War. Yet it is crucial to understand that the state of California did not act alone. The United States Army played an absolutely crucial role in this genocide, first creating the exclusionary legal system during the two years during which California was under martial law, then setting genocidal precedents helping to build the killing machine, directly participating in the killing, and finally taking control of it. In total, United States Army soldiers killed at least 1,688 to 3,741 California Indians during this period, and probably many more. Again, these numbers are quite conservative. So if state legislators were the architects of genocide, federal officials helped to lay the groundwork became the final arbiters of the killing machine's design and ultimately paid for most of its official execution. By 1863, Congress had given California more than $1 million in reimbursement money for those volunteer militia campaigns. Of course, by the year 1863, the U.S. Army had already taken over as the primary state-sponsored killer, and Congress, of course, controlled that institution's budget as well. Indeed, federal legislators paid for some or all of the many lethal campaigns against California Indians that began in 1846 and ultimately concluded in 1873. Like California Indians, indigenous people across the country suffered devastating and massive population declines following the arrival of newcomers. Before contact, perhaps five million or more indigenous people inhabited what is now the continental United States, the so-called Lower 48. By 1900, U.S. census takers 
counted only approximately 250,000 survivors. What caused this catastrophe? Diseases, colonialism, and wars all played important roles, but was something more sinister also to blame? Now, academics have long debated whether or not Native Americans or any particular groups of them suffered genocide during the conquest and colonization of the Americas. This is a particularly important subject given that the near obliteration of North America's indigenous peoples is one of the formative events in our nation's history. As in many other Western Hemisphere countries, the Native American population cataclysm in the United States played a foundational and decisive role in facilitating the conquest and colonization of millions of square miles, the real estate and cornucopia of natural resources upon which this country was built. So how we explain and understand the Native American population cataclysm directly informs how we understand the making of these United States. Beyond interpretations of United States history, the stakes include issues such as public acknowledgement, apology, monetary reparations, control of land, control of natural resources, Native American political <laughs> and cultural sovereignty, and ultimately national character. Now despite these high stakes, the question of genocide remains unresolved. And there are two factors that polarize the debate. First, only some participants use the United Nations Genocide Convention as their definition, even though 147 countries have signed or are parties to it, a growing body of international case law supports it, and it remains the only authoritative legal definition. Just as important, many participants in this debate emphasize rendering a verdict of genocide or not genocide in a kind of binary uh, formulation for the entire history of the United States, both before and after 1776, and sometimes for the entire Western Hemisphere from 1492 until the very moment in which we are sitting right now. Across the United States, though, American Indian population declines took place at different rates, over millions of square miles, and across centuries. Colonial, state, federal, and other policy-making personnel changed over time, as did official Indian policies. Moreover, literally thousands of tribes were involved. Their resistance and accommodation strategies varied, and they changed over time. Thus, despite the many published histories of violence against American Indian peoples, the details revealed by the California case suggest a need for more local and regional studies to provide the data that will ultimately allow us to assess genocide's occurrence, variability, frequency, or absence in other regions in the United States as a whole and elsewhere in the Americas, from Patagonia to the Arctic. Perhaps someone in this room, maybe some of you in this room, will undertake such studies. Assessing the question of genocide in the United States and beyond without an agreed upon definition or a substantial number of detailed case studies makes it extremely difficult for us to reach comprehensive conclusions. The direct and deliberate killing of California Indian people between 1846 and 1873 was more lethal and more sustained than anywhere else in the United States or its colonial antecedents that we yet know about. Still, there remains a pressing need for additional detailed case studies of other places in the United States and beyond. The variables present in California did not recur in precisely the same combination or at the same intensities in the histories of all Native American peoples. In some other cases, diseases, we already know, was the overwhelming source of mortalities. Both state and federal or colonial and metropolitan decision makers were not complicit in each and every case. Other Native American people deployed very different survival and resistance strategies. For example, fleeing contact zones or successfully pushing colonizers away. Finally, in other cases, 
Colonizers may have committed fewer or no genocidal crimes, while the causes and rates of death differed substantially. We need to build on our existing knowledge with new research in order to understand the full picture for the United States, North America, and the Western Hemisphere. The United Nations Genocide Convention provides scholars with a standardized, internationally recognized rubric and a coherent legal definition that may be consistently applied. Scholars should, I believe, rigorously consider each case in consistent terms. Just as importantly, we can consider each on a case-by-case -case or region-by-region -region basis, nationally and internationally, to create a scholarly precision in our use of what is undoubtedly a politically explosive term, and to seriously evaluate the balance between variables like disease and the five genocidal crimes in the convention. So I hope that this book points the field toward clear and consistent definitional standards and application. Detailed case studies are a very important part of genocide studies because case studies provide a powerful tool with which not only to understand genocide in the past, but to combat its denial and to prevent its repetition in the future. Native American people experienced and reacted to conquest and colonization in a wide variety of ways. Rigorously examining this range of experiences, using the Genocide Convention to evaluate both genocidal intent and genocidal acts will help us to move the discussion of genocide in the United States and the Western Hemisphere toward clarity. Unbraiding each region's story from the tapestry of American Indian history and bringing each into sharper relief will create a clearer, more vivid portrait of Native American experiences and of the history of the Western Hemisphere as a whole. Such investigations will be painful, but they will help all Americans, both Native and non-Native, to make more accurate sense of our past and ourselves. We don't have to accept the word of those who conjure up threats and false enemies that justify the business and profit of war if we recognize there is another superpower. And that's us, ordinary people everywhere. By speaking out, they deliver a warning to all of us. Can we really afford to be silent?